Miss Anita, what a wonderful song. We've been changed by the power of God and we won't go back. We have no plans on going back. Uh, my name is Pastor Lonnie. I'm the pastor of Family Ministries here at Middle River. I'm here to welcome you all this morning. If you're here for the first time or if you're new here, whether in-house or online, we want to welcome you. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us all this morning. Now, I have a lot of announcements for us all this morning. I apologize in advance, but I'm going to move through them as quickly as possible. Uh, let's see here. Oh, first, uh, as you may have noticed, um, we have uh, a gentleman here uh, who is our new interim uh, minister of music and worship, Reverend Bruce Connolly. Uh, Reverend Bruce Connolly has a long history of ministry, uh, serving in various capacities. He served as minister of music in, in various churches. He served as a lead pastor, and he currently serves as a director of missions. So we are really blessed to have a man with uh, the great experience that he has uh, to, to serve and worship with us. So he'll be leading the service this morning. Um, I also want to uh, take a moment to uh, thank Mark. Mark has filled in the gap uh, in these last two years, I think it's been now, um, it, it filling in the gap uh, for worship, and he's done a wonderful job there, uh, giving the volunteer his time. Uh, and he's been gracious enough um, to, to work with me. We're going to be putting together uh, a second service, a young adult service, uh, with the focus towards uh, young adult and young families. Uh, we're going to be putting that together in September, on September 27th. And, and our goal is to create something different uh, that speaks to the, the generation uh, that we see out here uh, across the street uh, and in this community. Uh, so we're going to be working on that. If, you, if you're interested in helping us in our pursuits, we would love to talk with you. Please come and see me. Uh, I'd love to talk with you. Uh, but we're going to kick that service off on September the 27th. Um, also, um, school supplies. Um, <laughs> so, uh, school supplies, uh, we're still collecting our school supplies. Uh, we have I think, over 130 kids who have registered and signed up for school supplies. I want to thank everyone who's given so far. It's been a real blessing as we collect. Uh, we, you still have time to give if it's on your heart to give. Uh, our last day for a collection is sep September the 3rd, uh, so you have time to give up until then. And then we'll be distributing the school supplies on September the 5th. Uh, so if you have any questions, please see my wife. Uh, she's sitting down there in front. Um, just please see her about that if you have any questions. Uh, Lady S'mores Night is coming up. It's going to be uh, on August the 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. So ladies, you don't want to miss out. Bring your lawn, ch your lawn chairs. Uh, we're going to have ind individually wrapped items uh, for the s'mores. Uh, so it should be a great time of, of fun and fellowship. Uh, so please come out. There's a sign-up sheet, I believe, uh, on the Women's Ministry Board out there if you have not signed up yet. Um, we're going to be picking up our youth Sunday school again starting next week. Uh, so youth um, or parents, if you have youth, uh, you can bring them during the Sunday school hour 9 a.m. We're going to have our, our youth Sunday school class starting next week. Uh, I also want to let you all know that we are looking for a new housekeeper. Uh, so if you know somebody or if you're interested in the position, uh, please call the office or re reach out to uh, our personnel director, um, Tom Holbrook, uh, if you want more information about that. Uh, but in the meantime, we are volunteering uh, to clean the sanctuary and clean those areas um, to make sure they're safe. Uh, so if you want to help us volunteer in cleaning, uh, we would love your help. Uh, please either see myself or see Ricardo about that as well. Uh, our last uh, one, um, there's a prayer request that we have. Ms. Barbara Gibson uh, is in uh, Bayview Hospital. She's had a couple falls and uh, they're trying to see what's going on, but we want to keep her in prayer. Uh, and she's, we're trying to figure out, the doctors are trying to figure out what's going on with her. So please, please keep in prayer, uh, Miss Barbara Gibson. All right, let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you, uh, Lord, for another opportunity to come into your house, uh, to worship, uh, Lord, to praise you for who you are, Lord, the wonderful God that you are. Uh, such a blessing um, that we can be called your children, Lord, that we can be uh, in your house to worship, Father. And we pray that as we uh, present our worship to you, Father, it will be pleasing uh, in your sight, Father. We pray that we will remove any distractions in our hearts and minds, Lord, and focus on you, uh, for only you are worthy to be praised. Lord, we ask these things and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, saints at Middle River. Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning, and hopefully for many mornings to come. I'm going to ask if you would stand as we read responsively the words that will appear on the screen. And the reason I'm asking you to stand is because these words are from Psalm 103, from the Holy Scriptures. 
Praise ye the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who, who redeems, redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones, who do his bidding and obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants, who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you please be seated? As we now prepare to sing hymn 202, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
Mighty defender is 
isn't he? Isn't he? Wonderful. 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 Isn't he? Isn't he? Prince of seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, everyone straight before him. So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Go forward, march around the city, and let the armed men pass on before the Ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua had commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets with the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go out of your mouth, until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going about at once. And they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord walked on, and they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp, so they did this for six days. On the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. 
And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all, that's within, and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who were with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers who were sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpets, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they captured the city. Then they devoted all the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys, with the edge of the sword. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. Let us bow in prayer. Our Father, we praise and worship your presence. We pray, Father, as we enter into your presence, that you forgive us our little faith, that you cleanse us of our sins, fill us with your spirit to hear, to listen to, and obey your word. Not to understand everything perfectly, but to undertake what you've called us to do as a church. We pray, God, that you would be glorified in the study of your word, that you speak to our hearts, that you would empower us to serve you this morning, and we pray, Father, that you will fill us with hope. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, in the Bible, Pastor Lonnie has read one of the great miracles, once again, in the history of Israel during the, this particular time as they're going in to possess the land, and the Bible begins in chapter 6 by saying that there's a city in front of them named Jericho. Now Jericho chapter 6 begins and they're facing their first, well actually their second major obstacle as they go into the land. There's this city with these uh, archaeologists tell us they were probably double walls. They were several feet thick. I've read as much as 15 feet thick, uh, maybe 20 to 30 feet high. And Jericho uh, is right there standing in front of Joshua as he's leading the nation. He's looking at this first major obstacle to go in and take the land. Now, some of us today uh, feel like we have fortified walls, uh, walled-in cities in our lives. Maybe it's some kind of habit, some kind of sin we struggle with, some type of infirmity in our flesh some type of influence in our life or circumstance, it's there and it's staring you in the face and it says, I dare you to take me down. That must have been what it was like for Joshua as he looks at those walls of this fortified city. And I think in this text, we can gain some applications or some principles. Joshua gives us a strategy for doing, doing battle with our own fortresses, our own spiritual fortresses. So I want to ask this question, what strategy does Joshua give us in doing battle with our own struggles, our own spiritual fortress, fortresses? So let's look at some principles. The first one is this, attack your Jericho head on. Now it's interesting to read uh, the book of Joshua and this military commander, this man, because in some of my reading about him in the, in the past, it said that his military strategy has been studied even at West Point about how he led the armies into the land. Now what Joshua does is he goes straight into the heart of the country, into Canaan, the promised land, right in there to the central part, and he's going to drive a wedge by defeating Jericho and then take a campaign to the south and to the north. And the principle for us is this. You can't take down your Jericho walls if you're going to act like they're not there. You have to recognize them and identify them and attack it straight on. It's a pleasure today to be reunited with my dear friend Bruce. 
we served together years ago when I was a much younger pastor. I'm not going to pick on him. He was much younger too. But I was much younger and he was my first minister of music and worship I ever served with. And then years later, we were reunited in denominational service as we both served as directors of missions in our respective associations. But I remember I thought about this, you know, you hear the expression sometimes, uh, there's an elephant in the room, but nobody recognizes it. And Bruce and I were in a denominational meeting a few years back. He probably knows what I'm talking about, and it was supposed to solve some issues. And we had all these people gathered together. And at least two, maybe three times, maybe more, somebody got up in the meeting and said, we all know what the elephant in the room is. And you know, by the end of that day, that meeting was about eight hours long, I guess. By the end of the day, you know what I asked myself? What was that elephant in the room? Nobody ever identified it. People said there was one in the room, but nobody ever told us what the elephant was. So sometimes it's that way in our own walk with God. There's an elephant in the room. There's a Jericho. There's a walled-in city. And we must admit it. And we must recognize it. And we must say, Lord, come and help me take down this fortress. Lord, I claim your promises. Give me the power. I don't have it in myself to do this. And so attack your Jericho head on. Another principle here I think that would help us is this. Obey God even though it may seem absurd to do so. Obey God. You know, the victory plan here, when you read this chapter that Pastor Lonnie just read, the narrative, it sounds more like a parade than it does a military campaign. It's like a religious festival. It's an odd way to fight a battle. There couldn't be more an unconventional way to take down a city than to, for six successive days, march around one time, uh, blow some trumpets, have seven priests blowing trumpets, preceding the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, on the seventh day, march around seven times, round the walls again, and then finally they shout, and the walls come tumbling down. What an absurd plan, you know. You know what, one of the problems today, this is just Keith's opinion, uh, for years now, churches have worshipped at the idol of pragmatism. They, they'll, they'll run off to conferences, pastors will run off to conferences, they'll hear about this church down here, and it did great things, it took down some walls, and they'll run down there and find out what they did and said, well, let's come back and do that at our church, because whatever worked for them, must work for us. Well, that's not always the case, is it? Uh, you don't see God ever doing this again. This was a, a, a particular work of God. Uh, God did it sovereignly. He did it at a point in time in history. It may be better that we just get close to God and let Him speak to our hearts and follow His Word. Now, when we do, when we do, we're going to look pretty silly. Have you learned that following Jesus and trying to obey His plans seems absurd to the world around you? I mean, what, you know, I've got a lot of wonderful commentaries on the book of Joshua, and some of them are simple to understand, and some of them are more technical in nature and hard to read through. And I got one, one time I was studying in this book, on this chapter, and so I decided to get down my... My, my really hard commentary on the book of Joshua. It was a Veggie Tales video. And so I put it in and I watched it. And it was interesting what they depicted. They had these little characters on top of the walls who were the Canaanites, trash talking the Israelites and making fun of them as they marched around the walls. Now that could have been happening. Maybe, maybe the Canaanites, and the Bible says in verse one, that Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. Now we know that the Canaanites were scared to death inside. Their hearts were melted with fear. But it was also shut up as a fortress. So there's a problem here on both sides, the Canaanites and the Israelites. But maybe when those Israelites marched around that city day by day, those Canaanites were up on the walls and look at you fools, you bunch of clowns. 
You think you're an army? You think you're going to take us down like that? Just talking trash and everything, making fun of them. And they looked absurd. Maybe even the Israelites, as they marched around the city, felt pretty absurd themselves. We look kind of dumb walking around the city thinking we're going to take it down this way. Do you know, think about how God has commissioned us as a church to take down the spiritual fortress of unbelief in this community. What, what method did he give us to do that? Or what, I should say, what message has he called us to take? To take down the fortress of unbelief. You go about the, what Paul says is the foolishness of preaching. Preaching what? Preaching the gospel. You mean you're going to go out in this community? You're going to go with your acquaintances and your friends and you're going to say to them, do you know how to get to heaven? Do you know for sure that when you die, you will go to heaven and be with him? Or would you have some doubt about it? And then they say, well, I'm not sure. How should I know? And then you explain this message and you say, well, God sent a man from heaven. And that man was born of a virgin. And then that man lived 33 years of perfection, sinless perfection. And then at the end of that, he died on a cross for your sins. And then he was buried in a grave. And then the third day, he came up out of that grave alive. And if you place your faith in that and admit that you need him and that you're a sinner, and you place your faith in him alone, you will go to heaven. And the world says that's foolish. That's, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. You mean I'm to put all my eggs in that basket? And we say, yes. Because we know and hear that the foolishness of preaching is the power of God and the salvation. That gospel message, when it's preached, it creates faith Amen. in dead, sinful hearts. And people come alive like modern day Lazarus it's all over the place. Jesus needs to be preached. And that will seem absurd sometimes. We need to understand that it's not all, you know, all these other things. Finding out what works. Yes, we do need to find out what works in our situation. But never at the expense or sacrifice of the foolishness of preaching the cross and the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because that's what works. That's it. But it will seem absurd to the world. But our job is not to understand. Our job is to undertake what God calls us to do. And God has called us to spread the gospel. To spread the word of Christ. To placard Christ. To preach Jesus. That's our job. To undertake, not to understand. And so it may, absurd, it may feel absurd. It may seem absurd to the world. But thirdly, the third principle is keep your central focus on God. Keep God central in your focus. Now the ark, we've talked about that before. But the ark is right in the middle of the procession, again, representing God's presence. And these trumpets, uh, the Jewish people call them shofars. I was in a meeting with some Jewish people last year. And we were celebrating the Passover, and this guy looked over at me, and he said, how did you like, he, he was, uh, I don't think he was Jewish, but he was very into the Jewish practice of things and the ceremonies, and he looked at me, and he said, he went up and blew on the shofar, the trumpet, and he came back and sat next to me, and said, how did you like the shofar? I said, good. He said, shofar, so good. <laughs> and I said, oh, look, very corny. But anyway, the shofar announced the presence of God. And they're going to blow those trumpets. And they're to focus on God's presence. And the real miracle here to me, that may be just as great as the walls come tumbling down, if you look at it, these people had to walk around those walls all the time, all that time, and be quiet. Now, they could not have been Baptists. Because you can't keep... You can't keep a group of Baptists this size quiet that long to walk around. Here's multitudes of Israelites walking around the city in 
complete silence. What a miracle. I've done some good Friday services, you know, where we've tried to emphasize, when you get done, walk out in silence. Sure enough, and people get back about a halfway back and can't keep from talking. It's quite a miracle. They're silent. Why? To focus on God. And that silence, and they walk around the city, and they go back to camp at night, and nothing happens. Do you ever feel like that? My walls. How long are these walls going to be there? It's some thorn in your flesh. Oh God, how long do I have to put up with this? Oh God, when is this wall going to come tumbling down? You just be still, the Bible says in Psalm 46, and know that He is God. Be silent. The Lord will fight for you. One day those walls will come down. You may have to put up with those walls all your life. But trust me, if you are in Christ and you know Him, one day those walls are going to come tumbling down. The trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those walls are going to come tumbling down for us one day. We'll be free from sin, free from our struggles, free from the presence, the power of sin. Be silent before God. And that helps us to endure. Keep Him central. Keep Him focused. Be dependent on Him as you face your Jericho, Jericho walls. Now, I want to just shift gears, uh, do a little detour here. And I almost preached a separate message on this, but I decided not to do that. I decided and still just to put it in here. And I want to ask this question. Is God good in the transition? When we're looking at Joshua going in here, you see, Timothy Bulger, he was a Baptist pastor out in Kentucky, and I was listening to him once, and he said there's two types of sermons. One sermon is an amen sermon. Uh, that's when you, you know, we talk about the walls. Listen, the walls came tumbling down by the power of God. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Amen? That's an amen sermon. How many times children have, have uh, sung songs and, and did these amens to the walls of Jericho came a tumbling down? But Timothy Bogger said there is also another kind of sermon, and that's an oh my serve. And when we learn about God and His character, it exposes our wrong-headed thinking sometimes about God, and we look at God, and we look at what He's doing here, and we do say, Amen, the walls came tumbling down, but we also say, Oh my! Did you see it? You can read it, it's right there in black and white in verse 17. The Bible says in verse 17, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. And then look down at verse 21. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction. Both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. Oh my. This is a serious judgment. This is a serious matter. You know, and many people today have problems with this. They'll read this. And I remember going to pastor a church and I had to live with a family before my wife could move down with me. And I was living with this family and this lady asked me that I was living with. She set me down in her living room. She says, I'm reading through the Bible. I said, great. She said, but I'm in the book of Joshua and I'm reading where God is wiping out these people. She says, I don't understand this. Can you explain this to me? And a lot of people have problems with this. Is God good? Is there something, is there a problem with God? That he would exterminate or eliminate these people? Well, this passage actually, if you look at it the right way, I believe teaches us that God is good. And let me explain God, first of all, is perfectly just. He is holy and He is just. And the Bible is teaching us here that God, did God, you know, I used to read books when I was back in seminary and some of the commentators would say, God didn't really tell Joshua this. 
I mean, he just thought God told him. Well, I have a problem with that because when you read the Bible, it looks like God told him. So I'm going with the Bible. I'm going to go with the Bible. When I believe here that God used Israel as an instrument of his justice, his judgment. Now, before we get too far, let's remind ourselves sometimes God in the history of his own people used other nations to judge Israel. So, God is just. God is holy. And the Canaanites were not. They were a depraved, a wicked, notoriously vile and depraved people. Archeo archaeological studies have shown that they sacrificed their children, their firstborn, to their gods, their deities. Archaeological studies have shown they discovered jars with little babies stuck in the jars head first. They sacrificed their children to their deity. Uh, they were a nature religion, and they believed in the mystical process of generation, and the way it got that working was through sexual activity, and so there was a lot of sexual immorality in the practice of the Canaanites, and all sorts of vile, corrupt, violent behavior. God is holy, and God is just, and the Bible teaches that he must punish sin. And that's the miracle of the cross for us, that on the cross, God justly dealt with sin because God is a just God and He punished His own Son, Jesus, in our place. God is perfectly just. But you know what else this teaches us about God? God is incredibly patient. Now, Here's the problem most people have when they read this. How could God act in such a capricious, unpredictable way and all of a sudden just go in here and wipe out these people? Well, back up now. Did God do that? Because remember Rahab earlier when we studied about her? She said to the two spies, we heard about you guys. When you crossed the Red Sea, when was that? Forty years ago. Let me ask you a question. Is 40 years enough time to give people to repent? 40 years? You parents, any of you had children? I had three sons. Oh, my Lord. Three sons. Kept my knees callous. And I used to go in there sometimes. What if I went into the room? Boys, you clean up your room. I'll give you 40 years. Is that enough time to clean up the room? I remember one time my boys were watching them. It was when I was at Beltsville with Bruce. And my boys had just watched the 1984 classic by Arnold Schwarzenegger. You remember? I'll be back. And, and they had watched that movie, The Terminator. Well, they got them all wound up. They're in there jumping on the bed. And I went in there and I said, you boys cut it out. They didn't listen. Started back. You boys cut it out. And I went back a third time. I said, that's enough. Out. The judgment had fallen. And I said to my oldest son, you go to your room. And his room was down the hall. He starts walking down the hall like this. And he goes, I'll be back. <laughs> you can't win sometimes as a parent. But if I had given them 40 years to repent, would that be enough? But the reality is, it was longer than 40 years God had given the Canaanites to repent. According to the book of Genesis chapter 15 verse 16, the sin of the Amorites would have to be complete or full. He had given this nation 400 years to change their ways. Is that enough time to repent? Our nation is 244 years old, I think. Is that enough time to turn to God? God is incredibly patient. Are you glad He's patient with you? He is a good God. He is a just and holy God. And He is a patient God. And if you've not come to Him, He is giving you time to come to Him. Now, don't delay. Because one day the judgment will fall. And God, last of all, is good because He is amazingly merciful. Did you see who He saves here? What was that promise? 
Rahab had made with the, the oath with the spies, and now God is going to spare her the judgment. He's going to use it, Israel as his instrument of judgment after 400 years of giving the nation time to repent. But now the judgment falls. Listen, God is patient. 40 years, 400 years? What about six more days? Is six more days enough time to get people to turn around? How about one more day? How about seven more trips around the walls? God gave them time, but the judgment fell. But there was one family, Rahab and her family, he saved with that scarlet cord in the window. Many have associated the scarlet cord with Israel. It could have been associated in their mind with the blood on the doorposts at the Passover, perhaps. But it was a sign that she was to be spared. But let me tell you, years and years and centuries and centuries later, what happened? The Lord Jesus Christ shed His blood on a cross so that if we would place our faith in Him, we too would be spared, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, from the wrath, listen, from the wrath to come as we wait for Jesus to come back. We will be spared from that if we place our faith in Christ alone. Have you done that? You see what you're saved from? You're saved from God's justice against our sin. He's being patient with you. And he's a merciful God. He comes to you in mercy and grace and offers you full salvation through Jesus Christ. But you must turn to him. Turn away from your sin and yourself and your unbelief and turn to him in faith and say what Paul said. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from judgment. God is a good God. Amen? Amen. And if you look at God... Look at Jesus, and you'll see how good he is. Let's pray. Father, we, we pray this morning for all who, in the sound of my voice, will know in their heart they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved. And help us, Father. Help us to follow you, even though it may seem absurd, Help us to undertake what you're calling us to do, not to understand, but to be obedient and to leave the results in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Keith, for that wonderful message. Before we leave this morning, I just want to remind you that we're not doing offering in the traditional way, but we do have plates in the back where you can drop off your offering as you leave this morning. You also can mail it in to the church uh, or bring it by the office. And we also have a link on our website uh, to give as well if you'd like to do it that way. Uh, and to close up the service this morning, we're going to have Reverend Bruce Conrad. Please stand for our closing prayer and benediction. Father God, thank you for every person who has come to this place today to worship you. Thank you for every person who will view this service either over the internet or later this week. We thank you for every family that's represented. And Lord, it's our prayer this morning that we would take to heed the words of our pastor. And Lord, we ask that you would give us an opportunity to be a blessing to someone this week and share the gospel of our Christ with them. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You are dismissed.